Hello, everybody. Uh, yes, I'm the bench warmer. <laughs> the coach has said we need you. The team's missing a player. So sucked into you, sucked into all of you. Uh, a, a key sort of issue for you will be... <laughs> to, to <laughs> it's pretty good, isn't it? Uh, so I hope you've had a good, you know, good uh, sort of session up to date. So what I want you to do is relax, enjoy the food, and just lower your expectations. <laughs> if you've got a belt with ten notches, take it out about eight. Uh, so, yeah, this is sort of what we're looking at here. Um, and I guess the other thing, whenever I come up to do talks, I always think I'm the best man at a wedding. And so I just want to say, doesn't everyone think the bridesmaids look absolutely stunning? <laughs> Who would have thought that scarlet mini dresses would have, they would have pulled it off? But they have. So cheers to them. OK, now let's get on to... So we're going to do in two parts, uh, partnering with carers, and then we're also going to look at advanced care planning. And that was really heartening sort of information there that uh, a lot of you have had that sort of discussion, end of life uh, care discussions with uh, a loved one. Um, Obviously, I would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today, and I pay my respect to elders, both past, present and future. And also, thank you to uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room today uh, as well um, for me being able to be here. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge our lived experience, so um, particularly of carers in the room. And, you know, we know there'd probably be quite a large number of carers uh, in the room today. So, you know, I want to pay my respects uh, to you. Particularly uh, where I work, we do focus quite a lot on staff and the caring roles that they undertake, as well as providing care to, to patients and consumers as well. Um, and, you know, that's the bottom line. Anyone can become a, a carer at any time. And I guess, you know, your caring journey may end, but it will echo for the rest of, for the rest of your life. OK, so partnering with carers, um, I've got to stick to this thing. Um, so, look, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of our service, OK? So we're dedicated to promoting carers as valued and respected as partners in cares. And that's our little house you can see there. I'm at the front. I can see when people are coming, so that's when I start looking busy and, uh, and uh, taking uh, fake phone calls. T is not here. She wouldn't know. Uh, <laughs> and she won't believe you because I've got a very good relationship with my boss. So, um, uh, so, But the thing I love about an old house, it's very old school. It takes me back. And that's the, the credit to Tia and her predecessors. We have carers who might have had contact two, three years ago, and they just bowl in the door. Like, I'll sort of stand there trying to work out who they are, and they just sort of walk in straight down the hallway, and I go, oh, you've been here before, and, and they say yes. You know, so I think that's great. I, I love it. You know, the person who stole our TV set, maybe <laughs> I should have assessed it a little bit more. Um, but we do have a massage chair in there as well. Um, so... It's at 91 Holden Street, and you're all welcome. Please feel free to come along, because uh, that's what it's about. It is a, it's a place uh, for people to have a bit of a break. There's a massage chair uh, there that was donated by the Freemasons, and it's probably one of the most aggressive massage chairs <laughs> I've ever used. So you really got to strap yourself in. It, it, it really grinds pretty hard. So um, there's also parking available at the Care of Support Unit in the front. So it's really good for people doing short... Uh, consults or going into the specialist centres, the carer can just park in there, the, the person they care for can have the consult and then the, out, out they go again. So that proves very popular. So please get, feel free to get in touch with us. Um, so what do we do? Um, there's carer support units throughout the state uh, in, in every LHD, but they've probably all got a different flavour as well. Um, so this is the sort of things we do. We'll obviously do the debrief support, referral, service navigation and subsidised parking. And I was speaking with our, the wonderful Carers Australia, uh, Carers New South Wales, Carer Gateway. They are probably one of our key sort of referral points, uh, you know, at every time. So if you haven't been there, 
this is a paid promotion. Go over there and, and get the information there because it's really, it certainly transforms the carers we work with uh, and, and the connection to services and support. So that's one of our key roles is just to actually shepherd people in identifying themselves and then uh, recognising the sort of supports that they can ac access. Um, so there's also, we have a support and consultative group um, planning ahead and self-care workshops for carers and also a lot of education for staff. Um, we've been involved in the Human Experience Week and kindness events and research and quality improvement projects such as Pets Are Family Too um, and Care Identification, which is, as it says, we're just trying to identify carers uh, within the hospital system because um, they can sort of be invisible even f for themselves as well. Um, and I think it was important, the, particularly the, the multicultural, the cultural aspects that we talked about earlier. Did, there, there's a, a huge dimension of cultural, uh, multicultural and cultural issues and also family, kinship. That broader caring network is super important and we can sometimes, uh, you might see a carer, but there may be a whole network of people uh, who, who are also playing a role in the care of a person. Um, oh, that's, we do doggy daycare, so if you can look up doggy daycare, and it's just wonderful, so that's one of our partners, so when we do a promotion event, we have doggy daycare, and it's just extraordinary once you uh, involve animals, there is a pony, which uh, hasn't been released yet, but it's, it's coming apparently, um, uh, but how much open people, after they've petted the dog, I can talk to them about some boring things and they're, they're engaged, they listen. So it's very, it's a really good tool. Um, if I could have brought them today, I would have. Um, it would have helped me get through this. Um, so anyone can be a carer at any time. So there's about, you know, nearly just under a million carers, um, including, you know, very young people but in caring roles, particularly, you know, in the Family and Care and Mental Health Program, for instance. You know, there can be people supporting um, their parents. Um, and these are, look, these figures change uh, all, all the time, but about approximately one in eight New South Wales residents is a carer. Um, and probably the key thing is, you know, many carers do not know they are a carer. You know, they just think, of themselves as a wife, son, daughter-in-law, friend, just doing what they need to do. And that's, that's good in itself. Um, um, and like I was saying, you know, there's probably carers in this, well, it's not probably, it's certainly there's carers in this room um, as well. Um, now, the Carers Recognition Act, so just the definition of what a carer is. So it's an individual who provides personal care support and assistance to another individual who needs it because that other individual either has disability, has a medical condition, including uh, terminal or chronic illness, um, or has a mental illness, or is frail, um, and, age, frail and aged. Um, and carers are not paid service providers. So that's probably the thing. And sometimes that can get, oh, my carer's coming in, but it might be a service provider. And that's not a knock on the service provider, but it's just to sort of try and delineate what a, a carer's role is versus, uh, you know, paid support workers, um, psychosocial support workers, etc. cetera. Um, so a carer is not an individual under contract of service. Oh, we sort of belabor that point a little bit, but you get, you get the meaning um, of that. Um, and also, just because someone might be a spouse or de facto partner, parent or child, it doesn't necessarily mean they're a carer either. Um, um, okay, so why does it mar matter? So I sort of think, you know, caring impacts on everyday life and probably um, I think uh, caring is sort of part of the fabric of society, basically. And, and I was going crazy with analogies um, and, you know, if we pull at that thread of caring, if we pull it out, everything falls to pieces. So uh, it's, it's a super important part of the society we, we live in. Um, and trying to recognise that and support that. Without it also, so, and recognising the love and care, support, hope, all those lovely words um, that should actually mean something as well. Um, the more sort of uh, practical aspects is the carer uh, sort of knows the, the patient you're looking after uh, or has a view um, on them. Um, the patient, the client, the consumer, however you like to, to call it. So, so they're an incredibly important um, 
asset. Even, you know, I'm sure you can call to mind carers that might be quite challenging and the like, but it gives you, the beauty of that is it gives you an insight into the relationship and how that might be, you know, so whether it's good, bad or indifferent, you're, you're getting an insight into relationships and what sustains people. And even I did some research into elder abuse and, and the like, and you know, one of the things that stuck out was the, the, the person who was subject to the abuse loved generally, in most cases, loved that person. They just wanted, wanted the abuse to stop. And that makes things a little bit more complicated. So it's not like a, a punishment system or things like that. You've got to work trying to uh, uh, sort of maintain relationships, but also uh, minimise or mitigate some of the negative impacts uh, of some of those relationships. So um, yeah, it's always complex, but, but uh, very interesting. Um, we've got an obligation to partner with carers and to support staff who are carers outside of work. Um, and we just can't assume that, uh, you know, people, carers know they're carers um, and they know what services and support exist to help them. And uh, such as clearly like carer payment and carer allowance. And it absolutely, blo it's blown me away my time with the carer support unit. People just have no idea. And that's why I feel like a huge hero. I just send them over to care gateway and then they come to me and go, oh my God, that was amazing, you know? And I get, yeah, I'm pretty good, <laughs> you know? Um, and I was, I was saying that the, the engagement with carers are where you engage, there's listening, support. Um, they are so incredibly grateful, but also so incredibly resilient. So you don't have to give much and they're off and running. So that's the other thing. It's incredibly, I found it incredibly rewarding as well. Um, and the bottom line is, you know, where you have those good structures in place, uh, you know, uh, people are able to ma maintain, you know, their health and wellbeing at home. Um, that's, that's probably the most important thing. And also, and can it sort of help avoid premature admi readmissions. But I've also, I'm a bit, um, I always feel bad about, you know, that's just a happy byproduct. I don't care whether it keeps people in or out of hospital. I care that a relationship's engaged, people are getting the care they need, that they're recovering, they're living the life they want to lead in the community. The good thing is that helps uh, usually means people don't need to come to hospital. They can go to their GP, they can get their stuff sorted. Okay, so, um, so what can we do? You know, one of the big ones is, is sort of go, is listening to somebody and this getting in their head going, oh, you're a carer, uh, you know, and, and for them to sort of understand that that brings a certain status as well uh, and respect that we, we try and provide in that role. Um, so helping a carer, so, I should just backtrack, I don't go to someone, you're a carer, <laughs> all right, go out there and care, damn it. Um, we, it's, again, it's the journey, the same with the consumer, it's that journey for the person to start, you know, uncovering those things about themselves and those strengths that they have. Um, and, you know, we can help the carer, you know, it's a no-brainer, listen, support um, and refer, like, you know. Um, it's, it's, that's, that's pretty much, uh, that's a really key support. And I think I was saying over there to my newfound friends at Carers New South Wales, is the, the, like, you know when we look at all these clinical models, engagement, engagement, engagement. If you work hard at listening, feeling that you start feeling that trust and, and hope bubbling up, then you can go from there. And it's, so it's the same, same certainly with carers, but there needs to be a lot of listening first. Um, and of course, for the patient and the staff, uh, partnering with and involving carers in discussions, service planning, discharge, etc. You know, it just you it just triples the sort of benefits and outcomes um, often. Um, and so, you know, like my work in peer work and things like that, they're my colleagues in care. You know, they're 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 our partners. So, you know, I'm nice to my colleagues and I'm nice to carers, and whether it's lived experience workers and the like. It's, uh, we're, we're all sort of in this together. We've got those shared goals. And, and I guess the other thing is uh, all these things like understanding people's values, what's important to them, all that. 
uh, usually they, they'll coalesce, you know, we, we, the, the, those broader outcomes are there uh, for all of us. Um, so there's care gateway, so it's just some of the supports and what I'd say is don't listen to this, just go over there, go to care gateway and uh, yeah, have a, have a chat with them. But they're, where they're fantastic is they've, they've got resources, they've got links, they've got uh, a listening ear um, and as I say, often say well, carers are saying, okay, we've, it's, this isn't just a one-off consult, this is part of your journey and they can start that journey and they might need to head back down to the well in a year's time or, or sometime later to do that. So um, it's part of that journey. Um, carers New South Wales, also, I didn't know this, uh, T's got a dollar ten movie tickets, who doesn't want to be a carer? Um, <laughs> And also, um, the family and care and mental health programs are also fantastic. So, and it's not mutually exclusive. So there's care a gateway, but if the person's also, you know, has mental health issues in the sport, linking them up with some specific support through the care and mental health, family and care and mental health programs in your area um, is, is useful as well. Um, there's a companion card, so carers can go to events and venues. Um, and I think the big one is, uh, linking people up with Services Australia around carers' allowance, carers' pension and things like that. They can be really a game changer. You know, if someone gets $150 a week through a carer allowance or something like that, it can really uh, make... Is that a fortnight or a week? Uh, you, a fortnight. Ooh, OK. Yeah. But it can make a huge difference with just adding on, could be adding on services or supports or anything. So uh, we do do a fair bit of work of trying to connect people up into their benefits and allowances. Um, so just, just a quick shout out that there's the National Carers Weeks uh, grants, um, and that's through the Department of Communities and Justice. Now, what I'd say is it's not really like carers organisations we're going to put in, but it's actually for departments, uh, palliative care services. Uh, throw your hat into the ring, um, you get about 500 bucks and put something on for the, the carers, you know, morning tea, doesn't have to be uh, super, uh, you know, uh, you know su super complex um, and, and say, I referred you and they'll just go, oh my God, $500, just straight out of the wallet. Um, and it closes uh, next Monday. So yeah, give that some thought because it's just another way of saying, you know, thank you uh, to the carers. Um, okay, that's sort of the carer stuff, okay? Um, now, we're going to talk about advanced care planning and probably, I'm just checking my time. How, am I, how much time do I have left? Ten. Ten. Okay, good. Um, so, the probably important thing about advanced care planning and particularly with, I, I think, palliative care, it's, it is, it gets that, it has that resonance of being uh, near the end, but actually it's something we should be doing everybody right now before uh, things become hairy. I still remember um, uh, my sister, I've got seven sisters um, and one of them was in St George Hospital, ICU. And then we're all in there, because I come from a family of 12, so there's a lot of people in this room. And some of my sisters, they were ready just to pull the plug. She'd only been in there like 12 hours and everyone in ICU looks like they're going to die. Um, but it was amazing, it just struck me the sort of values people bring to, to death and dying and, and how they perceive healthcare and, and treatment and outcomes. And so there were some there just going, well, this is it, they should just let it go. She is famous, my sister, for being probably the... She, they've been calling her, you know, sort of like my dad, you know, they've been calling their death for the last 20 years, you know, they'll get crook and I'll get through again. You know that anticipatory... And they're going to be right one day. They still haven't been. Uh, well, with my dad, they have been right. But, uh, yeah, he, he still... I used to say to him, oh, how are you going, Dad? And he'd go, don't know if I'm going to make it tomorrow, you know. And one day he was right. He didn't. But uh, that was quite many years after. Um, so a real key thing about advanced care planning, one, do it early, but also consider who's your personal responsible hierarchy. If you're not able to communicate, who is the person who's going to be able to... And what you want, you want someone who can walk in your shoes. You know, someone you go, they get me, they know how I might want stuff. Um, 
So the top of that hierarchy, so when uh, you know medical service are looking at it, would be an enduring guardian, someone who's uh, appointed enduring guardian, or a guardian appointed by the New South Wales Guardianship Tribunal. Then it drops down to a spouse or de facto partner who've had an ongoing relationship. Then it's a carer or someone who provides an ongoing regular care and is not paid for it, excluding carer's allowance, and also a close friend or relative. That is hierarchical. So if it was an enduring guardian, that would supersede a, could be a spouse, it could it supersede a carer as well. So it's important um, uh, just, just to keep that in mind around who would be a person responsible would go to if a person was able to um, express their treatment wishes. Um, so just with advanced care planning, advanced care planning is a process. Now, an advanced care plan records health care wishes, and what we're talking about is beliefs, values and preferences regarding future care decisions. Um, now, the thing with an advanced care plan, it can, it can be written on your behalf, so it's not legally binding. So um, you might have someone who may have a decision-making disability, um, and you can still work with them to do an advanced care plan, but there may be circumstances not biting. However, for me personally as a clinician, I love it when people have provided this context and background to someone's life. It, it, it certainly helps, and it certainly would have helped Aaron in his decision-making, that process, about if, if there was some information of... Because my sort of feeling is, what does a person look like when they're happy? Even in these circumstances, people are communicating things and people look a certain way when they're happy, when they're content, or when they're sad or when they're in pain. So there's information that doesn't have to be super complica complicated or philosophical. It could be just what makes me happy, what hurts, what makes me sad. Um, so uh, the thing is, yes, that's... Uh, that's Generally, advanced care plans probably done on behalf of someone so um, who might have limited capacity. The other one, the advanced care directive can only, oh, thank you, can only be completed by a person with decision-making capacity. I'm like, uh, I've gone to 1.5 speed. Um, so, about themselves. So, advanced care directive can only be done by the person, the person who wants to explain their beliefs, values and preferences, okay? Um, it is legally binding. Uh, my, I've got, uh, there's some documents that you can get, advanced care planning documents, New South Wales Health, Central Coast has their own, and also the um, Advanced Care Planning Australia have documents to do, and I would strongly encourage you to do, th uh, to do them. Um, this is the most beautiful opportunity to sit with your family and talk about, have some real discussions, okay, about your, and it's always going to surprise you. Um, and it's going to challenge you, but I guarantee there'll be a deeper relationship there if you just listen to what the person wants and what they're talking about. Um, uh, okay, so it's not, this is not a patient and client thing, this is all of us thing. Um, so discuss it with the family. Um, and it's not yet, so it's, it's, it's not an end of the line thing. Um, so it's over 18 with capacity can write an advanced care directive. Um, and even just having the conversation, you don't get to the written stuff, it's still super handy to have those discussions um, as well. Um, oh, the video, have I got time for that or I just mute? Could you play it please? Yeah. My name is Diana and we and I are husband and wife. My name is Anita and John is my dad. My name's John, uh, I'm Quibby's husband. So Roy gets to go on a trip of a lifetime. Where does he want to go? <laughs> um, I'd say Bora Bora. <laughs> no, I definitely want to go with Bora Bora. What food could Anita not live without? Probably um, curry. Anything Asian? <laughs> he couldn't live without a lot of food. And what about you? What food could you not live without? Probably fruit in general. Probably chocolate. <laughs> Just chocolate. <laughs> what? 
Anita are asking me, so what's this about? <laughs> I said, I don't know. If you can think about a moment where you pushed through a hard time together, can you describe that? At school, when she was being bullied, we had to see some counselling. Just talking me through it and helping me get through it. Kind words and lots of hugs. For me, it was probably the time when we were first trying to have a, our, mm. our first child, I guess. Uh, we went through IVF and, and things like that. Becoming parents is something that we all hope would come naturally, but it didn't to us initially, and we worked through that together. Roy's hurt in a car accident. He needs a breathing tube for the rest of his life, and he'll never speak again. Would you consent to this? Well, yeah, I would, yeah. No, I wouldn't, definitely not. I don't think I would want to put burden anyone with that, so I'd rather not. <laughs> yeah. Anita had three months to live. Treatment would give her an extra two months, but she would never see outside of a hospital. Would you consent to treatment? Yes. This was a difficult one, this one. Two months, you know, it's just one week, two months, any, any time. Not at all, <laughs> no. That's unexpected. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be kept in a hospital for forever. John has, has had a massive stroke. Does he want a feeding tube to keep him alive even though he'll never talk again? No. No, I don't. Um, it's very important to me to be happy and functional in my life. No, I wouldn't want that to happen. Roy's in the last stages of terminal cancer and his heart stopped. Does he want CPR? Probably not. I don't think you would, no, I don't know. So how do you both feel after um, answering those questions and why? I felt quite, it felt quite um, confronting in a way. Um, but... You think about it and you talk about it just very lightheartedly, but I don't think anyone really mm. puts a lot of thought and, and serious thought into, into it. it. No. Why do you think that some couples don't talk about this? It's not a pleasant subject. I mean, nobody wants to, to dwell on the fact that they're going to die one day and possibly in adverse or difficult circumstances. So if I was to tell you that advanced care planning is essentially a conversation that helps your loved ones know what medical treatment to choose for you if you had a sudden event, what would you think about it now? I think it's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. It's important, not just for yourself, but more so for your family, I think. Definitely have to have a bit more of a talk. And it's not just about the two of us. We For also kids, have kids, kids and all that kind yeah. of stuff, yeah. So there is a bit we need to consider, consider. yeah, 100%. Mm. So I didn't, I could have just waffled on, uh, but I didn't really need to. I think the video says it all. Um, so what do you want to do with your written advance care directive is give copies to the people that matter to you. Uh, if you've got an enduring guardian, obviously you give a copy to them. Uh, you can upload it to my health record um, and take it, in the, take it into hospital with you the next time you go in um, and you can ask for it to be uploaded to your electronic medical record. Um, and you can keep it in an emergency care plan folder in case you are taken to hospital by ambulance. And those guys have got some of those emergency care plan folders. They're holding it up beautifully. Yeah, they're fantastic uh, for, for people. Um, and put instructions of where to find it and the curry in your fridge or on your fridge. Um, and there's a wallet card too that Advanced Care Planning Australia has as well um, uh, to do that. So um, I'd encourage you to go there. So. Today's key messages, so carers are not uh, paid workers. There, there's a de delineation between those two. Um, 
when you think of patient, when you think of consumer, when you think of client, also think carer. Um, even when you're seeing the person by themselves, think about the ties that bind them to their community and to their family and friends. Um, and advanced care planning, um, as our Central Coast one goes, think about it, talk about it, share it. And that, my friends, is that. Thank you, Patrick. We probably don't have time for questions, but I thank you for delivering that really powerful with a light touch initially, and the video is very effective. Um, fortunately, we're going to have you back for the panel. So, um, yeah, it's not the last we'll see of Patrick. So thank you very much.